So I'm very pleased to have uh, Brian Ludmer here with us, and uh, I'll get you to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I'm a lawyer in Toronto, Canada. I've uh, been practicing since 1987. Um, first half of my career, or more than half, was uh, doing uh, business law, mergers and acquisitions, and uh, public company work and venture capital. And then I've been primarily doing a family law practice at a firm that I started uh, that uh, has now grown to um, kind of 10 of us or 11 of us. Um, and uh, been doing that since about 2006, 2007. And um, I, I'm on the advisory board of organizations uh, in many countries dealing with some of the problems that, that kids face in, in these very extreme cases. Um, I'm involved in advocacy work for equal shared parenting. I participated in the drafting of the last Canadian attempt at an equal shared parenting bill to amend our laws. I was an invited witness to our parliament to speak to two committees studying recent changes to our divorce laws. Um, and um, a lot of my cases have really helped to move the bar in our, in our law. Our law is really fairly robust when it comes to protecting children from, from these really intractable, difficult cases. Um, so when one's a victim of parental alienation and goes to court, I know there's a lot of trepidation, costs, uh, time. What are sort of the likely outcomes and how expensive is the process and what can one do to kind of reduce the costs? Um, it can be a very expensive process. I just completed a five-week trial, a classic parental alienation case where um, my client was, um, there was supposed to be equal parenting and separation. And um, within about three, four months, he was wiped out of the kids' lives and been fighting to get back in ever since start to finish uh from the time the case kind of began from separation if you will right through to completion of this uh trial was uh, about three years um and uh culminating in a as i said in a five-week trial it's not out of the ordinary but on the other hand it's not necessarily the case for what you have to go through to protect your interest. So uh, I think the key thing in terms of controlling costs is uh, to try and get some remedies very early on at the earliest signs where the dynamic can still be kind of nipped in the bud at a less severe level. It's easier for the therapy to work at that point. You can get compliance orders because the children will actually come provided that the the court protects their right to a relationship with both parents. And ultimately, if the family system still doesn't settle down, a lot will come out of the therapeutic process if it's well designed. There is a pervasive failure of traditional therapy in these sorts of cases. So you really need to be experienced and know what you're doing in terms of structuring that intervention early on in the case. And the, a lawyer can help you with that, that part of it as well? Uh, a lawyer who is very experienced in structuring family therapy, who, who knows what the components are to give it a chance because the, the favorite parents and the kids are not going to be there willingly. No. Um, which is very unlike the typical um, therapist-patient relationship. You are there willingly and you're open to their suggestions, etc. cetera. Um, it's a collaborative process. In these cases, the therapy is really more of a psychoeducational directive process uh, to force change in behavior. So it, it, it takes somebody very experienced to be able to structure that properly because if it's just traditional therapy, not only will it fail, it'll actually wind up entrenching positions. So many parents um, in, in parental alienation cases, it seems like the alienating parent will lodge complaints about abuse or 
uh, claim it's estrangement, not an alienation. Um, how does a alienated parent handle that? Uh, and, and it seems like in many of these cases, all it needs is the child to say something or uh, alienating parent to just to, to make an accusation. Uh, you would think that the burden of proof would have to be on them to back up their claims. But oftentimes it just seems like just the claim seems to set the court off against the targeted parent. And so what is the best way a targeted parent, uh, what can they do? Because I mean, we parents are parents, you know, we, we always, you know, some parents will yell sometimes. It's just part of the dynamics. There's good parents and bad parents. Um, you know, we're all trying to do our best, but it seems like even the smallest slip up can be used against you. What can a parent do in those situations? Well, first, I mean, there are concepts of what is normative parenting. Um, and, and yes, a parent, it's not just in some cases, in all cases where a parent is trying to marginalize the other parent or poison the child against them, they're going to have a narrative they're, because otherwise it looks very bad on them. So we, we fight these false narratives in every single case. So one, you can be proactive, which is as soon as you understand what the other side's narrative is, you can go about doing the things that will disprove it. So um, inexperienced parent, no problem. Get a parenting coach, do some parenting courses, read some of the leading books on parenting, problem solve. And dollars to donuts, there will be no change in the children's behavior. It's just you're eliminating one straw man after another. Um, vague allegations of abuse, unless they're prepared to particularize it and give you a chance to refute it with specificity, it, it's not persuasive. Um, um, courts are used to uh, people making false allegations. So in order to counter the aura, if you will, that the other parent's trying to Great. We, we get a lot of collateral affidavits, friends, family members, sports coaches, whoever will be willing to sign an affidavit that this was an involved, fully normative parent, devoted, the children loved them, etc. And that helps to refute a lot of the allegations. And then you just tackle with evidence all as many of the allegations as you can. And at some point, the, the favored parent loses credibility. So you got you to gotta just work the problem. And, and you'll find when you look at the competing narratives, most of the false allegations are like high level, vague sorts of things that, that are almost designed. Um, there's just not enough detail there to attack it. But to the extent that there's a time, a date, a place, whatever, gives you the opportunity to zero right in, give your side of that incident, collateral evidence, and, and you just keep track of those. And you keep right. a list over time. In this affidavit, I refuted five of them. And then in this case conference, I refuted another two. And this, and you just keep your tally. At some point, it is the cumulative impact of that is, is quite telling. Yeah. Do the judges look at currently what's happening? So suppose someone was alcoholic, uh, but they're going to AA and they clean themselves up or they're, they, they used to be a drug addict. They, they, they do regular drug tests. Do the courts look at what's happening now as opposed to 5, 10, 15 years in the past? Yes, they, they're focused on what's happening now. And it's very common for the um, alienating parent to just try and dig up every single piece of dirt they can twist it out of all distortion, leave out crucial details such as, okay, that happened, not quite the way you said, but you did leave out the fact that it was seven years ago. Mm. And when you point that out to the court, it, 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 they, they, they know. So yes, they're focused on today. And do you need some temporary supports for your parenting plan? And, and it is looked on quite favorably if you would say, I did have a problem, here's the program I'm in, it's been under control for two years now, this is just dredging up 
old stuff from the past, which is not relevant. Well, that's excellent. I think that'll give a lot of peace to, to people who think that all hope is lost because things they've done many years in the past. Um, now, there's been some people, um, uh, Joan Meyer, that she's got a study out talking about how parental alienation is just a defense for abusive, primarily, I guess, men, like, or maybe it's both. Um, is that starting to be, be being taken seriously in court? I'm seeing a lot of people worried that, you know, some of these papers that are sort of challenging parental alienation. And I know there's papers on the other side, um, uh, Jennifer Harmon, Bill Burnett, they, they, they've been coming up with the counter arguments, but it seems like everything's still very new. Have you seen this in the court system? Is there an impact of her papers? I, I don't think. Uh, her papers are taken very seriously at all. Um, uh, the, the study that Professor Harmon and um, uh, another psychologist and lawyer, Dr. Lorandos, did specifically refuting that paper was devastating. There's another one that they're, they're just about to complete as, as a supplement involving a lot of Canadian data because our trial decisions are completely accessible and very detailed. So there's, there's a, a companion article that uh, the data uh, is, is just being finalized now. I've, I've read a lot of the stuff from the denier community and it, it, it's actually fairly easy to refute, but they are, they're fighting a very rear guard action. The, quantum of scientific articles that support the concept, the, the root of the concept grounded in family systems thinking, which is, is mainstream psychology from uh, the leading theorists of the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and it's the foundation for family therapy, family systems thinking. Um, the fact that the concept just describes the human condition. You, you can't really refute it. It's like refuting that the sky is blue. So there may be this sort of debate going on in mental health circles, but in the courts, it's um, you don't really see that. The battle might be over what a particular remedy should be, uh, that the five-week trial that I just uh, concluded was all about that, should there be a protective separation or not. Um, but not the concept it, itself, which is too well established. I mean, we even have case law in Canada that, that says you don't need an expert to prove it. It's so notorious that courts take judicial notice of it. Uh, secondly, that you can decide these cases just, just on a factual analysis of which parent is being helpful, which parent is being unhelpful, which parent is not doing certain things that would be helpful. Um, and you can look at other cases where experts may have testified for their insight. So it, the Canadian landscape, and for the most part, the American landscape, is just crystal clear. So they're, they're fighting a battle that's already been won a decade or more ago, uh, which, which is rather sad and, and, and really speaks to their real agenda, which is to perpetuate some perceived strategic advantages of what they feel their constituency is. And when I meet one of these people, I always say, tell me, at least half of my practice is representing moms who are being alienated. So what do you have to say about that? Mm. Um, and, and of course, there's not much they can really say uh, because the man is being the aggressor in that sort of circumstance. So, and and even even where a father is the primary target, there's a grandmother, there's aunts, there's female cousins, there may be a female child of the case. So women suffer in all cases. So, you know, I, I look for every opportunity I can to debate this denier community. They've been around for several decades. There's this group called the Leadership Council and, and, and some of the, 
you know, that you mentioned one name, there's others as well. The, their arguments are easy to refute, like surprisingly easy to refute. Oh, so, that's, that's you know, hilarious. here's something. I challenge any one of these people any day of the week to come and debate me. Okay? <laughs> How's that? Terrific. Um, you had mentioned that it's very important to get in sort of as remedies as quickly as possible. And I imagine that's why you are such an advocate of equal parenting laws. Um, what's the status of that uh, now? I know that it's, uh, I think Sweden has equal parenting laws, but the rest of the world is catching up. Uh, well, um, firstly, uh, there are groups that actually maintain um kind of data sets on where various countries and subunits are at. So you have National Parents Organization in the United States, and that organization was also a catalyst for a group called the International Council for Shared Parenting. I'm on two of their committees. Um, so yes, there's one or two Scandinavian countries that either, either legislatively or just effectively have equal parenting as at least the start, if not a default. Um, in, in the United States, there are two states that have, you know, a full rebuttable presumption of equal parenting. Uh, there's one state, Arizona, that has something that in practice is working out to be fairly equivalent to that, although the legislation doesn't quite say that. And there are at any time, including now, uh, about half the states have very have pending legislative amendments that would bring something like this in that are either in committee or have passed the legislature and are waiting for the governor to approve it or at an earlier stage. So it's, it's a very frothy environment, but it's heading in one direction inexorably, which is toward a rebuttable presumption of equal shared parenting. Nowhere has there been a rollback. So any jurisdiction that to our knowledge has actually tried this, it's worked, it's great, the population is happy, litigation rates go down, there's less stress. Um, interestingly, in a Kentucky study, less false allegations with this because there's there's less incentive and you know there's some disingenuous scuttlebutt that our, australia had tried this and didn't work out and, and 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 so they had to back off that's actually not what happened it, it, there's it, it's complex because they've gone through two rounds of, of changes but that but it, that was not the case so if you give a rebuttable presumption of equal parenting, a chance, give it a chance to work. The, the, um, it's, it's uniformly positive. And um, the sad part for today's generation of kids who are still exposed to all of this litigation and the resulting conflict is 20 years from now, it's gonna be pervasive and we're gonna look back on today and, and wonder about why we didn't move faster and how many kids were damaged by the process that, that the system forces their parents in. And where are we in Canada right now? You mentioned the States. Uh, yes. So in behind? Canada, um, we tried in 2014, 2015, that was that private members bill that I helped draft. Um, we had a whole bunch of presentations to the um, committees, both of the House of Commons and at the Senate, I presented to both two years ago. Um, at the time, they were considering Bill C-78. And, um, but the Liberal government was not going to support it. In, in the House of Commons committee, um, we managed to convince the Conservative members of that committee to actually move the amendment to the legislation but they were in a minority position on that particular House of Commons committee, so they got outvoted. But it just shows we have, we have good traction. Um, we're doing an update on our public opinion polling now, which uh, when that's done, we're going to publish the results. And um, we are moving uh, toward another private member's bill. 
Okay, excellent. Now, my last question is, um, so you had mentioned it's, it can be, you know, very expensive. Even if you interview in early, you're talking about, you know, uh, quite a long court case, which involves dollars. Uh, now, is there a way to handle this outside of court? Because I know some people are trying to handle this through mediation or through arbitration. Um, and so far, the stories I've heard, it's not been successful. Do you absolutely have to go to court or can something be done in arbitration or mediation? Well, mediation is not going to work and it's contraindicated because it's just going to foster delay. Somebody who's prepared to act like this uh, is not going to be amenable to what a mediator has to say. Arbitration is just another form of adjudication and arguably can be less formal. It can certainly be faster, but arguably it's more expensive because with a court, you don't pay for the, for the adjudicator, the public does. In private arbitration, the two parents pay for the arbitrator's time. Um, so it, it's got pluses and minuses, but it's still an adjudication. It's still trying to get findings and force the other parent to change. So what really can you do? It all comes back to early identification and getting yourself into a therapeutic process that is well-structured has the appropriate incentive structure, empowers the therapist over the parents, and you work the problem there. You dispel the false narratives there. You get the transparency there. And ultimately, if there really is one parent who's primarily at fault, you'll get a report that you could then use in court, and it'll shorten that process because you've already gone through this. So that, that's what I think is the best you can do early on outside of court, because there's a lot of learning that takes place. Even if the therapy fails, there's a lot of learning that takes place and you, you get a report that may be very damning to one parent. But even better, if it's well-structured, uh, to give it a chance to actually work. So that, that's about the only thing, but that's a, that's a whole separate, I, I do how to structure these sorts of interventions for success since the vast majority of therapeutic interventions fail in these cases. But that presentation is about an hour, hour and a half in and of itself. And I've really the precedence. Uh, so I, I've given that presentation for several organizations already. And I've, use my precedent in many, many, many cases. Well, maybe we'll have to get you back to talk about these. I, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled to, because I really think that's where the future lies um, in, in staying out of court or even in, you're in a court process, but it could be put on hold, and also be put on hold, slow down, and you're diverted temporarily into this structured intervention process. Um, so sure, happy to come back and, uh, we can uh, go through that. Yeah, well, the stories I hear that the nor normal court appointed therapists and you know some of the things that are done actually yeah. makes the situation much worse. Much worse, yeah. yeah. Well, I wanna thank you very much for your time and I uh, greatly appreciate this. Uh, the information is gonna be very valuable. And I think uh, you know, the people who are viewing are gonna really get a lot out of it. Really appreciate this. My pleasure, have a good evening.